It's a pretty choppy session today, but, but, but we were seeing signs that perhaps well, there was light at the end of the tunnel earlier this week. How do you decipher that this is whether now technically driven or something that has actually fundamentally changed? Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me on. Uh, yes, absolutely. We do see some guarded optimism uh, in the market right now. Uh, the market is very much focused on the rate of change. Uh, in uh, the level of infections, and of course, to the extent there's a view that um, these are topping out, at least uh, there is a, a sense of uh, uh, a view that um, markets potentially um, have uh, hit the lows uh, maybe a two or three weeks ago. It's important, however, to point out that uh, we are not yet aware of the economic fallout uh, from the um, coronavirus. That won't become apparent really until we get um, the Q1 and Q2 GDP numbers, uh, and obviously that's going to be some time to come. And so the market very much is, um, uh, I think, um, happy that uh, there is a sense the virus has topped out, but still potentially uh, on guard that uh, the night is still falling as far as the uh, economic fallout is concerned. How should I be looking at earnings now? Uh, what's going to be most important, the past, the future, the guidance? I mean, it, it seems like right now it all seems like it's just one big black box. So earnings uh, it poses uh, something of a challenge in this type of environment for obvious reasons. Um, as central banks are providing bridging finance to uh, various uh, employees and employers uh, around the world, Clearly, there's going to be a profound impact of, of the lockdown uh, and more broadly the corporate uh, shutdown uh, on earnings. In our view, we're not even close yet to even getting a sense of uh, what those earnings downgrades should be. I've read um, forecasts amongst our analysts of even um, up to 50 percent um, of further earnings downgrades likely. So I think we're a long way away from getting a sense of clarity. Um, uh, and to that extent, uh, whilst Credit Suisse has moved to a small overweight in equities uh, and did so uh, a couple of weeks ago on the basis that uh, the worst was behind us, nevertheless, we have ventured into only highly defensive names such as Switzerland uh, and within Switzerland, the healthcare sector. Uh, we have a preference for investment-grade bonds um, in other words, we are accumulating risk, but only the highest quality right now. And as you rightly point out, we remain concerned more broadly about the scope of the earnings downgrades to come. John, what do you like in the credit space at this point? Well, in Asia, I have to say, uh, the um, Asian high yield space uh, looks particularly attractive. Right now, the market is uh, pricing in a cumulative default rate of around 20%, uh, where it has only measured 2% uh, over the last uh, 10 years. And so, in my mind, an awful lot of bad news, uh, an excessive amount of bad news has been priced in, uh, and where issuers still need to be uh, extremely uh, focused on the underlying credit quality uh, of the names they buy. Nevertheless, I do think... Uh, you are being rewarded and compensated for the risks you are taking. In the investment grade uh, credit space in Asia, uh, I think um, we can expect uh, total returns over the course of the next 12 months of between uh, 4 and 5%. Uh, this is largely a function of uh, spread tightening. Spreads are now at levels we've only seen twice uh, in the last 20, 30 years uh, during the GFC and the Asian uh, financial crisis of 1998. So, again, we are being rewarded but in the IG space, but perhaps not as uh, uh, generously as uh, the high yield. Mm. To what extent is the oil story muddying the waters in this part of the world? Well, Asia, of course, is uh, more of a uh, oil price uh, a taker uh, than giver, if you will. Um, it's only really Malaysia that is negatively impacted uh, by uh, lower oil prices. The rest of the region is uh, a major importer. 
uh, and in particular the largest importers of the world uh, in China and Japan and South Korea are major beneficiaries um, of the lower oil price uh, and indeed uh, around Southeast Asia, India uh, in particular as well. Um, of course, weak and low oil prices reflecting a collapse in demand um, is clearly a negative. Uh, oil prices at sort of uh, 20 um, plus levels uh, reflect an, uh, a global economy on uh, the point of recession, which of course it absolutely is. But if oil remains at these sorts of $20, $30 levels um, into next year, 2021, then I think it will be an unambiguous positive for the Asia region. John, we've seen, when it comes to the credit space, a massive amount of debt issuance in the U.S. side. Are you seeing that in the Asia region as well? Uh, yes, there's a huge demand for cash in the U.S., which has led to this uh, extraordinary degree of issuance. Uh, no, uh, in Asia, this has not been replicated. Uh, there's uh, a high degree of leverage that has been playing through the Asian IG space. Sorry, I should say deleveraging that has been playing through the Asia IG space over the last five years, uh, uh, ten years. Uh, and uh, net cash levels uh, remain at reasonably um, prudent levels. Uh, so, in fact, uh, the level of issuance over the last um, uh, month or so at around five or six billion for the IG market has actually been quite modest uh, and has actually been um, substantially lower, uh, as you can imagine, on a on a year on year basis. Uh, so we haven't seen this huge dash for cash that we have in um, developed markets. As a, and as a consequence, um, my sense is over the next couple of quarters, spreads will remain um, reasonably well supported. Uh, we don't have a supply shock. Uh, the um, underlying um, quantum of uh, outstanding debt uh, remains essentially stable. Uh, and as such, I think the market um, uh, and, and market levels will remain supported.